I used to associate the word worship with music. Every time I thought of the word worship, I would think of a band on stage singing to God. And while that is a form of worship, over the years I've learned that there's just so much more to it. Worship can be every action that we do. And when God gave us the commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself, he was basically giving us instruction to live worship-centered lifestyles. Lives that are filled with actions that are fueled with an overwhelming yearning to give God the glory and praise that he deserves for everything that he has done and will do for us. Just lives that are completely centered on what God wants us to do because we know his love and we just have to spread it. So inspired worship really comes down to lives that are inspired by what God has done to worship in everything we do. Yeah, wow, what a great morning already. Lots to celebrate, lots to, uh, to think about. I don't know if you picked up on it or not yet today, but kids are valuable here at CCW. Families, moms, dads, grandparents, God, thank you for what you're doing to raise our kids up. What Eli and, and what Brody and Shelly and their teams are doing is worth celebrating and worth getting involved with. So if you've ever wondered maybe a purpose in your life or looking for something to do uh, with the talents and skills you have, see one of those leaders and say, hey, plug me in, I promise. In fact, it was kind of hard for me to come out here this morning because I kind of wandered back into Expedition Kids. And I'm hearing the foosball and I'm the basketball going on and I'm like hearing the kids climbing on the rock wall and I'm like, I would rather do that than do there. Okay, uh, you don't want to do that. I'm telling you, it's fun. Go on back there. Lots going on around here to celebrate. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about what's truly valuable in your life. Like, uh, if, if you think about it, and I don't know if you would agree with me or not, but I hope you would, that what we value in life, what we find valuable in our life, will shape the kind of people that we'll become. Like if, if you value your job or value money or value material things, maybe you value sports or you value your family, you value kids, um, it's going to help shape the kind of person that you are and the kind of person that you will become. And I can't help but thinking, um, last week I talked a little bit about my father who passed away from COVID-19 just two weeks ago. And, um, and I get, it, it, when something like that happens, as, many, as you, uh, many of you know, when you lose someone, it hurts and you miss them and you start to reflect on their lives and the things that mattered most about those people. And I got to thinking about my dad and the values that he held, uh, values like, like truth. Telling the truth mattered to my father. Honesty was one of his values. Caputos tell the truth. In fact, I can remember on one hand the amount of times that I saw my dad cry. And three times were after he stood up for me and then found out later that I had lied to him. Truth matters to us. Honesty, it's a value. I also know that, uh, you know, my dad, over 40 years in the post office, uh, I, think, I don't think he'd missed a single day of work. I honestly do not think he missed a single day of work. In fact, when he retired, um, I think he got to retire like two years early because he had saved up all of his sick days up until then. Um, you know why? Because hard work was a value to my father. It's a work ethic. So if you, you just think about your own life, what kind of things do you value? What kind of things define who you are? Not the things that you do. But the things that define you know, who, the person that you are, what will people say about you one day when you're gone from this earth? You know, at CCW here as a church, we've got these things that we call core values, five primary core values that are important to us to live out. It's not just things that we do. It, it kind of helps define who we are. So when you see kids up here on stage and you see, you know that they're doing these things. They're important to us. Uh, whether you're, a, you're, you're, a, you're an older person and, or whether maybe you're a, a new mom or maybe you're a, uh, I don't, wherever you come from today, you, you can be sure that any of our environments and programs and things like that are, are defined by, by the things that are valuable to us. Last week, we talked about the first one, which was biblical truth. Y'all remember that? The core value of biblical truth. Next week, we're going to talk about spirit-led living. We're going to talk about selfless service and real relationships 
all important core values to us here at CCW. And today we're going to talk about inspired worship. Worship is valuable to us here at CCW, inspired worship. You see, because worship isn't just something we do. It's not just something that we come to church to do together. Worship is who we are. It helps define who we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week as followers of Christ and as the body of Christ. When we talk about inspired worship, we're talking about putting God first in all things. Putting God first. You see, that's the greatest thing we can do. In fact, um, when we talk about our core values, we're talking about the habits of Jesus. Okay, so I just want to kind of help define. These are things we learn from Jesus himself. Jesus, the son of God who came from heaven to earth and lived a perfect life before our eyes. And we've got to talk about Jesus. I mean, we've got to look at Jesus if we want to see our core values. He lived a perfect life before us. He died as a perfect sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And then after three days, Jesus rose from the dead so that we could have life. And when you rise from the dead and you live a perfect life, it... You, Take a look at that guy because that's where we want to get our values from. And now he sits at the right hand of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. So our values are shaped after the things that Jesus did on on this earth. And one thing Jesus found valuable was worship. In fact, when we look at Jesus, we can see very quickly that that what he said was most important is something that we think is most important. He said that we are to love the Lord our God, to love him. That's where worship comes from. Lord, uh, love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And to love our neighbor as ourself. It's worship. So we look at Jesus, we see that that is the most important thing we can do. Is to love God with all that we are. Worship. Worship is when we recognize God's position in our life and we give him the honor that is due to him. This is the heart of, of worship. And as a kingdom community, as a church, inspired worship means that God, it means that his son Jesus, it means that his Holy Spirit are at the center of all that we do. All that we do on this campus, all that we do in our lives. He matters most. Above all, the words that we see used in the Bible, there's a lot of them for worship, but the most, uh, the most used words in the Old Testament is the word shaka. And in the New Testament, it's the word proskuneia. It means uh, it means to bow down. It means to, to to worship in an expression of love, to honor someone. And in a lot of contexts, it was it was meant for the king. And you would see somebody coming in and worshiping. They would bow down before them. They would lay down on the ground and kiss their feet or kiss their ring as an act of honor and submission and love to the authority. That's what worship is. And Jesus. Jesus himself, he described that uh, worship as a submission uh, to God, a living expression of love to his Father. You see, that's what worship is. It's a lifestyle. It's not just something we do when we get together. It's a mindset. It's a heart set. It permeates into all that we do in our lives. Another Old Testament word that we're going to see today is the word halal. The word halal, I love this word because it just, it means to, to shine on. It means to, to make clear. It means to, to clamor about. It means to, 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 to put on a show of, of worship, to celebrate halal. It's used 165 times in the Bible. And we talk about clamoring foolishly <laughs> for God. There's no better example of this than our companion for our series that we're going through these core values with. Anybody remember who it is? We're basically, yeah, who said that? King David, yes, yes. It was probably somebody at home watching online that said it. I heard it through the camera. Yes, King David, or maybe it was in building B, I don't know. Yes, King David, he's our companion for this series. David, he's one of the most famous people in all of the scriptures. As we said last week, more pages are dedicated to the life of David than anyone else besides Jesus. In David's life, we get to see the good and the bad and the ugly. We get to see every adventure, every, uh, every mistake that he made. And all through it, we see David with a heart for God. In fact, in the New Testament, God would call David a man after God's own heart. Because he would do anything God asked him to do. We see David's story in in 1 Samuel 16. How many of y'all read the stories of David this week? I challenge you to do that. All right, you're not raising your hands. Okay, you got a new challenge this week. All right. 
Read the stories of David. You can find them in 1 Samuel, starting at uh, chapter 16, goes all the way through 2 Samuel uh, verse, uh, chapter 24. We see it ending up in 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2, where David gives his last words to Solomon. And we also read his story in 1 Chronicles. This is where we're going to look today, 1 Chronicles chapters 10 through 29. And in the life of David, we see the values of Jesus. And that's why we can look to David as a man after God's own heart to become a church after God's own heart. David. And David valued inspired worship. You know, many people know David as the young man who killed the Philistine giant Goliath with a slingshot and a stone. Great, awesome story. But did you know that David, before, during, and after uh, Goliath was killed, praised God? He did it in the name of God. This is an act of worship. And many of you might know that David was a shepherd at the time, a young shepherd uh, caring for the sheep of his father, Jesse. And in the fields with the sheep, David was known to have played his instruments for God, to worship God. That is where he wrote many of the Psalms, was outdoors as he worshiped the Lord. A musician, a poet, using his talents, just like you've seen here this morning. Using talents to worship God. He worshiped outside in God's creation. He worshiped by, singing, uh, by serving King Saul in his palace. He seemed to be able to put God first, whether he was in victory or whether he was failing, whether he was angry and confused or whether he was having moments of clarity. David worshiped God. He worshiped in caves. He worshiped in fields. He worshiped in forests, whether facing enemies or with friends. When running and hiding and all alone or ruling, the whole world from his throne, David worshiped. He had a heart of inspired worship for God. David knew how to do this with a humble heart. It's a great example. David did it with a focused heart, a passionate heart. You know, last week I mentioned that David wrote over half of the biblical Psalms. And in those songs and poems, we see snapshots of David's, David's heart of worship. We see worship as a value in his life from the time he was born to the time that he died. In fact, Psalm 22, which is a famous psalm because Jesus quoted Psalm 22 from the cross. David says, you brought me out of the womb, God. You made me to trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. All the way through his life, we see David worshiping. In fact, at the end of his life, 1 Chronicles 29, these last words that we have recorded in that book, David said to the whole assembly, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So they did. They all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers, and they bowed down and put their face down on the ground and they worshiped the Lord, their king. David, from the time he was born to the time that he died and every time in between, in times of trouble, times of elation, when he was running away from God, he turned back to God. When he was in times of pain, times of sorrow, y'all know what I'm talking about, times of celebration, times of joy. Through every high and low of life, David chooses to worship. Because it's a choice that we have to make. In spite of the circumstances around us, it's a choice we make. You know what, the world just trying to steal our attention. Everything going on around us. From the pandemic to the elections to the things going on in our own neighborhoods and our own city and town. Our attention is, is just being divided. We need to put our attention to God and choose to worship him through it all. David is a great example of that. This man after God's own heart. So important. And David gives us a lifetime of worship to learn from. Today I want to take a look at a story from the highlight reel of David's life. All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and 16. Chapter 15 and 16, and there's a parallel story. The same story is told in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7. So 1 Chronicles 15 and 16. Now at this time in David's life, we catch up with him. He has, uh, he's already, by God's power, become king of all of Israel. He's defeated the, his enemies. In fact, specifically, the bad guys were the Philistines. The Philistines did everything they could to make things hard on Israel. And in fact, in this time, they had gone in, they had taken their people, they had taken the Ark of the Covenant, Israel's national treasure, where, where the representation, the presence of God was in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Philistines came in and took it away from them. But now David's king, and David is set to his heart that he is going to go in. He's going to take. So God gives him victory over the Philistines. David, David's able to bring the country back together again, get the Ark of the Covenant back to his people. 
and amazing things are happening in David's life. And what does David do? Does David turn all the attention to him? Look at what a great king I am. Look at my victories. Look what I've been able to do. No, David does something even more remarkable. He doesn't take the attention to himself. He turns the attention to God in worship. For David, this is a time to worship. He's bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, back to Jerusalem. And he creates this grand parade of praise. I want you to visualize this, okay? This grand parade of praise. You know, in those days, you know, the kings would be the highlight of the parade, sitting up on, I don't know, like an elephant or something. I don't know, and everybody praised the king. No, not David. David's on the road. I just picture David on the ground celebrating and worshiping God with the people during this story. Here's what it looks like. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 27. David, he's clothed in a robe of fine linen. He's got his priestly garments on. And he's with the other Levites who were carrying the ark, the, other, the priests. Not only were the priests there, but look at this. There were musicians and Kenaniah who is in charge of the singing of the choir. So we got music, we've got singing. And David also wore a linen ephod, it says. Now, in modern terms, this would be David's long johns. Okay, so underneath his garments... He had these long johns on, all right? Now this, Samuel, 2 Samuel gives us the picture of what's actually going on here. David is going to praise God. So, so he can't control himself. He is praising God so much that he actually loses his outer garments. And now he's praising God in his long johns. The king of Israel, all right? I just want you to have that word picture, okay? So, all of Israel, verse 28, all of Israel brings up the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord with, ready for this, shouts and sounding of ram's horns and trumpets, you know, you know, like all these ram's horns, trumpets, cymbals, the playing of lyres, which are like guitars and harps. I mean, we had a great worship time already this morning. We've got lots more to go today. We're going to sing some more songs together, have communion together. But man, we've got nothing on what was going on this day in Jerusalem. Look at those. Int- and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, which was David's wife, watched from a window. And when she saw King David dancing and celebrating in his underwear, she despised him with, his heart, with her heart. She's not happy with this. There's a lot of reasons for this. God actually gives us a couple more details in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6, verses 16 through 22. Look what happens when David goes home. I love these words. David returns home to bless his household. I mean, he, he takes his worship home. Parents, check it out, okay? Michael, the daughter of Saul, his wife, comes out to meet him and says, Oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. I think that's how she sounded. Going around, get this, half naked, full of view of the slave girls of his servants. As any vulgar fellow would, she's just not happy with David at all. What she's done is she's made a mistake. She, she, she thinks David's done this to bring attention to himself. And David, instead of correcting her, instead of attacking her, look what David does. David says to Michael, uh-uh. It was before the Lord, before the Lord who chose me, the ruler over the Lord's people. I was doing this for God. This is the Lord. This is worship. All right. I will celebrate, he says. I will celebrate before the Lord and I will become even more undignified than this. Like I got a long, like this is just the tip of the iceberg of how I'm, and, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. They was like thinking of himself at all. This is that God first humility that focus, that passion for God. Now we flip over to chapter 16, 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. And David does something even just incredible. This is something David was famous for. He, he puts Asaph, his worship leader, okay, in charge. And he gives him a psalm of praise to the Lord. And this, this, this poem, this song to God is loaded with inspired worship ideas. Stuff that we can really learn from. So take notes and listen to the words of King David. In fact, these are great words to worship with King David too. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse verse 7. That day David first appointed Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. And we actually see some of these verses mirrored in other Psalms as well. You know, David just had a heart for this. But look at verse 8. All right, here we go. David says, First of all, here's this word halal. It means to shine, to clamor foolishly. He says, give praise. Give praise, praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. David said, express yourself. 
Praise to God. Make known among the nations what he has done. This is important because David's not saying, look what I've done. Look what this nation of Israel has done. Look what CCW's done. Look what he has done. The attention goes straight to God first. And then verse 9, sing to him. Sing, sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. It's an act of worship to give testimony to God. To talk about what he has done. Look at verse 10. Get, uh, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Rejoice. Can we smile when we worship? <laughs> I mean, isn't it worth smiling when we sing and praise to God? Rejoice when we think about what God has done. And look at verse 11. I love this. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face. Seek his face. Always. Now I want to stop here for a second because this, and this is an important verse to me because, Again, all the attention that, that gets, it just it feels like the world's just kind of pressing in on us sometimes. And you know, we're just going through stuff. How important is it for us to stop and seek his face? You know, David would say in Psalm 62 that we are to rest in the Lord. Be still. You need to know that he's God. Seek his face. So if it's okay with you, I'd just like to, I'd just like all of us right now, at home, online, up in building B, in the gym, right here in this room, just to stop and take a deep breath and know that he's God. If you can close your eyes. Seek his face. Look to the Lord in his strength. Take a deep breath. Seek his face. It's worship. And while we're quiet, verse 12, David says, even with our eyes closed, to remember Remember the wonders he's done. I just want you to think, remember, what has God done in your life? What wonders has he done? His miracles. His judgments. Remember. Remember. Remember who you are in him. Verse 13 says, you are his servants, descendants of Israel, his chosen ones. Chosen by God. Seek his face. He is the Lord our God. Here we are, Lord. You are God and we are not. Seek your face. Verse 15 says he remembers his covenants forever. He remembers. He remembers the promises that he made to David and for a thousand generations to come. He's a promise keeper, he's a miracle worker. Mighty God, that's who he is. We worship him. You know, David goes on for the next few verses to remember the great things that God has done in Israel. He tells the stories. And in verse 23, after remembering the great things God has done, he says, sing, sing, sing to the Lord all the earth and proclaim Proclaim his salvation day after day. Proclaim his salvation. Do you all know God saves today? 
God saves, he delivers. In fact, that's why we preach on stage. This is worship. That's why we talk. That's why we give testimony to God. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Verse 24 says, declare his glory among the nations. Declare his glory among all the nations. The marvelous deeds among all people. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in the Great Commission. To go and make disciples of all nations. Starts with the declaration of his glory. In verse 25, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared among all gods. For all gods of the nations are idols. There's nothing else to be, God is to be feared. But the Lord made the heavens. Verse 27, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his dwelling place. That's where God lives in strength and joy. And I don't know where you've been living lately. I don't know what world you've been in and what kind of things you've been watching and what kind of things you've been. But, but who wants to live in joy and strength? I want to live in joy and strength. That's where God lives. And that's where we find joy and strength. That's where I want to live. That comes from worship. And man, if you're finding yourself in a dark place today, I want you to go home and I want you to worship until you see the light and feel the light and understand the light of God. Worship him and come out of that time in joy and strength. And verse 28, ascribe to the Lord all the families of nations. Ascribe, give him, give the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. This is worship. Bring an offering and come before him. That's why we bring our offerings and we're generous here at CC. We Offering is worship. And then he says, Worship, there's that word shaka, to bow down, to give honor. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. We serve and worship a holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. Holy, Jesus said to pray, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. His name is holy. Tremble before him. He is worthy to be feared and trembled upon, respected honored. He is God and we are not. Worship. The world is firmly established, David says. It cannot be moved. In verse 31, I would just picture David again, just thinking about his experiences outdoors. And he just says, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nation, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Can y'all say that? The Lord reigns. Let me hear you. The The Lord reigns. Let me hear again. Thank you. That's awesome. It goes to God. Man, and he says, you're not the only ones doing this. Listen to this. Let the sea resound and all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. When we say the Lord reigns, we are worshiping the God of all creation with all of creation. Worship. Verse 34, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Thanksgiving is the cure. I mean, if you're feeling down today, you're going through a hard time. We, we just do. Life is real. And the cure for that is to stop and to give thanks. If we're feeling depressed or angry, we take our focus off our situation and be thankful. You know, I'll never forget one time my dad, we were, I told this story before, I think, but my dad, you know, as I was chasing my young son, Logan, at the time, he was probably six years old and he was just running everywhere and Logan could not be controlled. And I was just exhausted from chasing him around. And I just went to my dad and I was like, I cannot, man, I can't keep up with him. I just, man, if he would just stop, he's just all over the place. He's into everything. He is running and running and running. And my dad said, just be thankful that he can run. <laughs> thankful, perspective. David says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Verse 35, cry out, cry out, save us, God, our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations. This is worship. This is a time when we know that it's okay. And David teaches us this, to cry out to God, to get real with him, to spill our hearts out to God. He he can handle our tears. He can handle our anger and our confusion. We can cry out to God for help, for salvation. And I know David, man, this warrior king, you know, he killed a lion with his bare hands, a bear. He killed Goliath with a slingshot. But I got to admit, with all due respect to David, the warrior, I read through Psalms and I think, man, this guy's like a crybaby sometimes. (laughs) But you know what he's doing? He is being real with God. He's opening his heart to God. And he's telling me that it's okay to do that too. God can handle our tears and he can handle our anger. The one thing we don't want to do is turn away from him. 
He wants a relationship with us, and he hurts with us, and he goes through these things with us, and he comforts us and gives us peace. And David knew that, cry out, that we may give thanks to your holy name. See, no matter what David was going through, he always turned it back to praise, to God, to thanks, to his holy name, and give glory in your praise, he says. And verse 36, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. For all of eternity, God is God. Praise to him from everlasting to everlasting. Then the people said, the people said, you ready? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let me hear you. Praise the Lord. And that's how David ends this psalm. Now, a quick review. I don't know if you picked it up or not. But worship is when we sing to him, when we praise him, when we seek his face, when we look to the Lord, when we tell of his works, when we rejoice in the Lord. All here, remember his wonders, proclaim his salvation, declare his glories. When we fear him, worship him, bring an offering to him, tremble tremble before him. When we sing for joy with all of creation to him. When we give thanks to the Lord, when we cry out to the Lord for salvation. When we confess, David would confess and ask forgiveness in places like Psalm 51 and Psalms 25. He confessed and he gave thanks and he prayed. Prayer is worship. In fact, in the very next chapter, 1 Chronicles 17, David gives a, just a dynamite prayer for the nation of Israel. And I want to encourage you to turn there and, and do this later today. Pray this prayer over your family, over your church. Just insert your name where David's name is. It's a great prayer. It's worship. Praise the Lord. And right here in 1 Chronicles 16, he just gives us all these ways that we can express our worship to God right here at CCW by putting God first. That's why we sing. That's why we play music. That's why we serve. That's why we give. Some of you dance, (laughs) celebrate, just keep your clothes on, all right? We declare his name. We proclaim his name. We do it in quiet. Y'all take some quiet time, even today, to be with the Lord We pray, we celebrate, this is us. This is not just something we do, it's who we are. It's a value. It's something we wanna wanna do no matter where we are in life. These core values, inspired worship. You can find them online. In fact, there's some next steps you can take. We've talked about these last week. Uh, They're on the screen, they're also online. Go ahead and check out some of these next steps. And I wanna encourage you again to just, at any of our doors and any of our buildings and even online, you can grab one of these challenge cards. Pick the core value that you wanna work on that you want to take a challenge from God with, take it home today, all right? Go online, download one, and then commit to doing what's inside of that envelope. The core value challenge card, all right? Do that. That's a great next step. But the next best thing we can do today is to worship, to worship some more. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to sing. I'm ready to worship God. And David knew, David, there's something we can worship that David was just setting the stage for with his life. And that was Jesus. See, David's life was just setting the stage for the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God who came from heaven to earth as the God-man. Jesus, Jesus the Lord, who before our eyes lived a perfect life again and died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could, could have life in his name here on earth and for all of eternity. Jesus rose from the grave so that we could rise from the grave and live for eternity and worship him forever and ever and ever. And that starts right now. Jesus is holy. He's powerful. He is loving. He is merciful. He says in John 14 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to the Father except through him. But through Jesus, we can get to the Father. We want to let him hear our praises this morning. So we confess the name of Jesus. We are going to, we're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to praise Jesus. Remember Jesus. Jesus, we're going to love him with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. He is the person and the object of our worship. Make no mistake about it. All of this It's about Jesus. So put him first in your life. Not just for this hour we're together, but your whole life. Focus on Jesus with all that you are. Worship him for who he is and what he's done. Wherever you are today, wherever you come from today, right now. So if you're at home and watching online, this might be the time to turn your lights down and turn the volume up. If you're driving in your car and you're listening to this, this might be the time to pull over to the side of the road and praise and worship with the family of God. In all of our buildings, building A, building B, over in the gym, get ready to worship because we are gonna sing together right now. Every man and woman and child of all ages, no matter your race or background, it's time to sing together. If you're a guest today, 
We're thankful that you're here and we're thankful we're not even, maybe you're not even sure who Jesus is today. I hope, I hope that you will understand who Jesus is maybe from our worship because he inhabits the praise of his people. We pray that our love for him will inspire you through our worship. We are God's people. We are followers of Jesus. And we are in the middle of a crazy time right now. I don't have to tell you that. But in all the things trying to steal our attention, we can focus our attention and praise on him. We choose to put God first. We choose to worship. So the rest of our time together this morning, in an orderly way, we are going to praise God. We're going to sing. We're going to have communion together. We are going to lift up the name of Jesus. The band's coming out. In fact, if you would, go ahead and stand with me. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to praise. Don't leave. Don't tune out. In fact, this is the time. God, together as your family, we want to lift up the name of Jesus, your son. We want to praise him. We want to give thanks. We want to do all the things that David just taught us to do. We're going to sing. We're going to play our musical instruments. We're going to raise our voices, our hands. We're going to kneel. We're going to cry. Whatever we need to do before you, God, right now, we're going to bring it all to you. We're going to lay it all there. God, you deserve it. Every word. God, please empty us out and fill us back up again. God, accept our praises. You are worthy. And right now, God, as we fill this building and our living rooms and wherever we are with praises to you, we understand that we're singing with the rocks and the trees and the fields and everything in all creation that praises your name. We lift you up. You truly are the way maker. You truly are worthy of our praise, God. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. We thank you for hearing our prayers and hearing our praise. All because of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Mm. Mm.